So I recently stumbled upon a uh, curious little book entitled uh, Sleeping with Bread. I, w- I want you to see this, and I'm going to read to you the opening paragraph, okay? Just, just take this. During the bombing raids of World War II, thousands of children were orphaned and left to starve. The fortunate ones were rescued and placed in refugee camps where they received food and good care. But many of these children, who had lost so much, could not sleep at night. They feared waking up to find themselves once again homeless and without food. Finally, someone hit upon the idea of giving each child a piece of bread to hold at bedtime. Holding their bread, these children could finally sleep in peace. All through the night, the bread reminded them, I ate today, and I will eat again tomorrow. So I read that and thought, what an image. Like, there's these children who have literally lost everything. And yet they're finally able to overcome their insecurity and calm their anxious hearts by holding a warm loaf of bread as they sleep at night. This image, like, captures so much. It just feels so right and, and feels so wrong. It, love and war, insecurity and security, anxiety, peace. It's like it's all wrapped up in this image of these children snuggling up with a loaf of bread as they fall asleep. But then um, right after I read that, like, literally right after I read that, I, um, I happened upon a report which describes how our children actually sleep. 78% of all teens fall asleep with their phones next to their bed. 17% sleep with their phone in their hands or under their pillows. I I learned a new word here. Um, They they call it um, vamping. It's vampire and texting smashed together. That instead of sleeping, they they text all night. And... And it struck me. Today, no one would ever think to hand a child uh, a warm loaf of bread to calm their anxious hearts. They would hand them an iPhone. Our children fall asleep with a warm iPhone in their hands. And maybe it's just me, but to me, the shift from like bread to iPhone, this feels significant. So in my lifetime, our world has changed in my lifetime. Our world has changed in ways that I can't even fully wrap my mind around. And I'm not just talking about technology here. I'm talking about the way technology has changed us. It's changing what it means to be human. It's changing how we relate to the most basic stuff of life. To bread. To food. So um, six, seven years ago, we're sitting down at family dinner. And my then nine-year-old daughter complained that the smoked turkey and her kale and arugula salad was clashing with the smoked gouda and kalamata olives. And I looked at her and explained, when I was your age, I was fed fried bologna sandwiches. (laughs) If we were really good that night, we got one of those little Debbie um, oatmeal cream pies, you know? The kind that are like... They have this unnatural shelf life and this unnatural creaminess that only comes from like a really good trans fat. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Like if you were to find a box of those like 1980s, I'm not talking about today, the 1980s oatmeal cream pies, holy cow, those things are amazing. Like one, I bet they'd still be fresh. And two, I bet you could sell them for like $100 a pop on the black market because they're amazing and illegal. It's true. Trans fats are illegal now. Turns out that those little Debbie oatmeal cream pots were basically poison and probably kill someone from Gen Z like just eating one. (laughs) But in the 1980s, it was a taste of childhood. Now, this might be a silly example, but it's true. Just in my lifetime, but if you go 100 years out Our relationship to food, what we eat, what it looks like, where it comes from, all of these things has changed radically. 
our concept of food, uh, the, in the rate at which it's changed, has changed radically. If you start reading history or start traveling the globe, you will discover for yourselves that our relationship with food, the suburban American relationship with food, is not normal. It's not normal. Like, we have lost any connection between, like, the thing that died so that we can live and, 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 and what we eat. We've lost any connection between, like, fields and farms and plants and animals and food. If you ask a child, like, where does food come from, they will almost certainly tell you, giant Wegmans, Wawa. I don't know, but they will almost certainly not talk about fields and farms. Now, I, I grew up on a farm. I should know better, right? Um, but even me, even us who are like a little bit older and wiser, for the most part, we do not know where our food comes from or, or how it got there. Like, it is shrouded, intentionally shrouded in some mystery. Like, we don't know how it got there, and we probably don't want to know. So when I was in fifth grade, I met a man who once worked in a hot dog factory. And that man told me stories that I can't unhear. <laughs> like, to this day, you offer me a hot dog, and I'm like, In involuntary gag reflexes. All we see, all we want to see, is like the perfectly packaged food product at the end. Bloop. Like, most of the food that we eat does not resemble in any, there's like no resemblance to the actual thing you'd find in creation. And I'm not just talking like Little Debbie and like hot dogs here. But those obscenely large chicken breasts, have you seen them? Or those tomatoes they sell at Wegmans. Those aren't natural, friends. God didn't make that. Until very, very recently in human history, like everyone was a farmer or just one removed. So like the food, it looked and smelled and tasted like the place it came from. Today, you have to pay like top dollar to get a farm-to-table experience, but just a few years ago, that's the only experience you could get. So this, this stirs up like so many questions, so many important questions that we, if we're going to follow Jesus Christ and be stewards of the good creation that God created, so many questions we, we have to ask. Like, is the food industry satanic? Probably should we be concerned about the global health implications of the normal American diet? Probably. Uh, are modern economic and agricultural practices unwise, inhumane, and dehumanizing? Dehumanizing people? And the answer is some sure seem to be. How about this? Do we have unresolved emotional and psychological attachments that express themselves in comfort eating? and or attempting to control every single thing you put in your mouth. I don't know about you, but sign me up for that one. So while all of these are worthy of consideration, and I think we as the people of God need to wrestle with these at some point, because it's basic to who we are and how we live. Today, I want to settle in on a more basic question, though. Something just absolutely core to our relationship with food itself. A question that is largely like overlooked, ignored, not even understood today. And it's this. What does food mean? Or to be more specific to the, the Hebrew text, what does bread mean? Now this, this is a question that would have made sense to almost any other person in any other era, in any other place in history. Like, in the pre-modern era, people believed that everything had, like, meaning and purpose, that everything had, uh, there was an unseen connection connecting all things to one another, that everything pointed to something else and ultimately pointed to something ultimate, to God. So, so, Everything has meaning. Bread has meaning. It has significance. Um, we said last week in this language, this is like that. And that, this points to that. Like bread points to something. The, the fact that bread tastes wonderful and gives you life, it wasn't accidental. It wasn't random. The, the fact that you had to like kill the wheat, crush the berries, knead the dough, 
leaven it, which literally means to bring it to life, then you have to let it rest before you can finally cook it and then eat it and ingest it and make it part of your life. For 12,000 years at least, people understood that this was heavy with meaning. No one thought that this was random. It, it meant something. Bread means something. But increasingly in our day, uh, you will find that people do not even have a category for this question. Not, not just because they no longer make bread, but because they, don't, they literally do not have a place in their brain for this question. Which, which is to say, it appears that someone has snuck into our children's bedrooms at night and taken out a warm loaf of bread and slid in its place an iPhone and then pretended like nothing happened. But something did happen. And that, that's what I want to explore today. To maybe ask it a little more startling, is, um, is holding an iPhone the modern equivalent of holding a loaf of bread? Does an iPhone or a Stanley mug or whatever gives you life, <laughs> does it have the same meaning? Does it point us to God the way a loaf of bread does or does the symbol itself, does the bread actually matter? Or to say it another way, when Jesus declares, I am the bread of life, could he have equally been a mango of life, or an iPhone of life, or whatever you think gives you life? Or does the symbol have God-given significance? Is there, as ancient people believed, something about bread that holds meaning, that is God-given, that signifies something about the way things really are in the universe? So we're in this series called Taste and See, borrowing that line from Psalm 34.8. That according to the scriptures, you can't just know about God. You have to experientially know God. You have to taste and see for yourself. And each week we're going to be exploring like these different elements of food in which God invites us to taste and see the God that you can neither taste nor see. To, to hear the voice that spoke that thing into being. So we'll be exploring bread, water, salt, oil, steak, and this week is bread week. Our text for today is going to be uh, Exodus 15 and 16. So I want to encourage you to turn there in the Pew Bible. We're going to be all over these two chapters. Um, but before we dive into Exodus chapter 15, I, I want to chat just for a second about why we're going there. And I want to set this up in the bigger picture. So why are we using this story to explain our story? What is it about this particular story of Exodus that, that makes it special? Why would I use this story to make sense of our stories and make sense of our relationship to bread? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a three to four minute overview of the first 14 chapters of Exodus. All right? All right, we'll see how this goes. So in the beginning, they, right, the people of God, they are in Egypt, and it's going okay for them. They're living in Egypt. But then the Egyptians do not like them. They do not have a positive view of them because they're, they're like bearded and they use this guttural language of Hebrew, the way Hebrew is spoken, and, and they're sheep herders. And so they view them as immigrants. In fact, they have a word for them. They will not call them Israelites. They call them Hebrews, which on the tongue of an Egyptian is a racial slur. And so eventually that relationship turns so south that they enslave them. They turn them into forced labor. And Pharaoh, who calls himself a god, the god of this world, Pharaoh, he enslaves the Hebrew people. And that's where we find them in the first chapters. But then God, Exodus chapter 3, God hears their cry. And because of his great love for them, he hears their cry, he loves them, and he raises up a deliverer, a redeemer. He calls a man Moses. Go, set my people free. So Moses then goes to Pharaoh and says, the Lord God says, let my people go. And he's like, who? Who? What if I don't? Well, he'll show you what he'll do. 
And then over the next few chapters, we get those 10 plagues, this unprecedented moment in history in which God steps into history in a way that the world had never seen. The God of the universe is now acting in human history in these 10 amazing plagues. And in those, he, he not only defeats Pharaoh, the God of this world, the king, he defeats the gods of Egypt one by one. He's killing their gods. That's what he's doing in that. And then finally, we come to Exodus chapter 12, which is the 10th and final plague, he is going to send the angel of death to kill the firstborn son throughout the land, all of the firstborn sons. This will be the final one that will finally break Pharaoh and set his people free. And in order for the angel of death not to come to the Israelites, the people of God, they have to, we rehearsed this last week, they have to kill the lamb. The perfect lamb has to die in their place. They catch the blood, they paint the post and lintel of the door, and then they go into the house under the blood of the lamb, and then they eat the lamb. And then when the angel of death comes, it passes over those who are under the blood of the lamb. They are redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Then, what happens? Pharaoh is broken by this last and final plague. He says, go, go, all right, fine, go away, leave me. I can't take this anymore. So they take the riches of Egypt and they go out triumphantly. Yay, we're free, we're free. And they make it all the way to the Red Sea and Pharaoh changes his mind. What's he do then? He sends his army. He changes his mind. I'm gonna go after them. What have I done? And they're trapped at the Red Sea, Exodus chapter 14, but then God makes a way where there is no way. He parts the Red Sea. His people walk through the sea. And as Pharaoh and his army go through, the sea collapses on them. And God has destroyed the forces of evil using the forces of evil once and for all. Now God's people are on the other side of the Red Sea. And they are the children of God. We once were slaves, but we've been set free. And there's a sea blocking us. So there's no going back. There's no way back to Egypt. Even if you wanted to go there, there is no way back because that's not who you are anymore. That's the land of slavery. So what does this have to do with bread and with us? That's the question. Well, the answer is nothing and everything. So as you read the scriptures, you find that this story is the context, it's the lens, it's the paradigm through which God invites us to make sense of our lives. This is not just a story, this is the story of how God saves the people of God. So if you consider yourself part of the people of God, this is your story. So this becomes, this becomes the map of how God saves the people, how he sets, takes people who are slaves and sets them free. That what it looks like to, to follow God on a journey. In fact, the New Testament authors pulling this language directly from the book of Exodus are going to describe our lives like this. Romans chapter 6, we were all slaves to sin. Ephesians chapter 2, we were under the prince of the power of the air. The God of this world, Satan, ruled our lives. But God, Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, because of his great love for us, he came after us. He sent a redeemer, Jesus Christ. He came into the world to deliver us from the powers of this world. And in Mark chapter 4 through 8, he defeats the gods of disease and demons and storms. He is over all the gods of this earth. And then Jesus, the Lamb of God, John chapter 1, sheds his blood on the cross that all who will trust in him, all who will come under the blood of the Lamb, shall be saved and then we feed on him by faith in the act of communion, John chapter 6. And those who are saved are then called to pass through the waters of baptism, just as God's people pass through the Red Sea. We now pass through the waters of baptism, and now we are a new people. We're, we're children of God. We're, we were once slaves, but we've been set free. And there's no going back. Even if you wanted to, you could not go back because you're a different person. God is taking you out of there. You can't go back. And now we're headed towards a new city and a new home, Hebrews chapter 11, for we were once slaves, but we've been set free, Galatians chapter 5. So do you hear this language here? This is not just a story about how God saved some ancient tribal people. This is our story. This is a map of our lives. This is, this is showing us where we've been and where we're headed. And this is how we start to make sense of what's happened, of where we've been, of our own experiences, and of the stuff of life. 
So, Exodus 15, well, we're no longer in Egypt. We're free. God saved us. He saved us. He smashed the forces of evil. We're done with this forever. And what happens? They break out their tambourines. This is where Exodus, like the drama, becomes Exodus the musical. Right? They're like dancing with tambourines, which I've never danced with a tambourine, but that sounds amazing. Right? You know you're having fun when. And so there, there's Miriam singing a song. Everyone's dancing. They're like, this is the best day ever. This party is never going to end. We're so great. We're, I'm never going to sin again. And that lasts about three days. Pick it up in Exodus 15, starting in verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur, Sinai Peninsula here. For three days they traveled. For, for three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. So this, this is what we believe the desert of Shur, this is what it looks like today. I'm assuming it looked very similar back then, Sinai Peninsula. Have you ever experienced real thirst? Like where your tongue starts like getting swollen, can't swallow? When I was in high school, I was um, on the wrestling team, and the coach, he would like to crank up the, the heat in the practice room to about 85, middle of winter, 85, didn't matter, because he liked us to sweat, he thought that was good for us, and, um, and if he was in a mood, and he was always in a mood, at the end of practice, he would um, make us run wind sprints uh, until everyone made a certain time, okay, here's the deal though, um, he would not let us drink water until everyone made a certain time. And I remember like cutting weights and I'm already drain not drinking water so that I can get in on the weight limit. And then I have to run wind sprints and I, I would be so thirsty that there were times I would take my own shirt and try and suck out just a little bit of the sweat so I would have something in my mouth. I imagine there's something like that. There's a survival guide, it's always, they tell you about the rule of threes, you know, you can go three minutes without air, three hours without shelter, like from dying of exposure, extreme temperatures, uh, three days without water, and three weeks without food. I want you to notice something, God has waited three days, no water. I mean, people are going to start keeling over soon if he doesn't do something. Verse 23, when they came to Mara. They could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Mara. It just means bitter in Hebrew. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, What are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. So God, you've just saved this people out of slavery. You clearly love them. You heard their cries. You defeated on great display. You defeated the armies of Pharaoh. You did all this. You clearly love this people. Now, what's your wonderful plan for their lives? Um, he says, well, I'm going to lead you to a desert. I'm going to take you to a place where you cannot meet your own needs. I'm going to bring you to a point of complete helplessness, to the very brink of death. That's my wonderful plan. Remember, this is not just the story of the Israelites. This is our story. So when we ask, like, what's going on here, God? All we get is that this is um, some kind of test. Then the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he, he tested them. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. This is a test. Are, are you listening to me? Are, are you paying attention? Are, are you hearing my voice? Chapter 16. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. 
It's the 15th day of the second month after they come out of Egypt. Now, when, when was Passover? When, when were they in Egypt? Uh, it was the 15th day of the first month. That's when Passover takes place. So it's now it's the 15th day of the second month. That means they've been traveling for an entire month since they last ate their Passover feast. It has been an entire month since they've had any food. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we set around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. You're trying to kill us here. So the Israelites... um, they get a bad rap for being whiny. And they are. I mean, hey, you brought us here to starve us to death. But to be fair, they, they have a point. God led them into the middle of the desert to a place where they cannot meet their own needs, to a place of complete and utter desperation, a place where if he doesn't actually show up and do something that they cannot do, they will literally starve to death and die. And he waits till they get to that point. It's been a month to that point where people are literally going to start starving to death. And then we read, verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And here we start to pick up a theme. Not just in scriptures, but if you follow God long enough, you've experienced this theme. So um, <laughs> when does God part the Red Sea? It's not, it's not like, oh, don't worry, I'm going to part the Red Sea, you're going to be fine. No, no, he waits until Pharaoh's army's charging down on them, until there's no other way, until if God doesn't show up, we are all going to die, and then he parts the Red Sea. So when, when does he stop Abraham from sacrificing Isaac? Is it long before, don't worry, I've got this covered? No, he waits until he goes up the mountain, binds his own son, builds the altar, lays him on top of it, raises the knife, and then and only then does he send the angel to stop him. When does he save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace? It's after, after they've been thrown in. And Jesus, when do we see God's ultimate work of salvation? Well, it's only after he's been nailed to a cross, died, buried, after the disciples lose all hope, all hope. This is over. It's done forever. Three days later, then, only then do we see resurrection, do we see the life that's truly life. Now, personally, I hate this. (laughs) Like, I wish we could skip the whole part where I, like, I desperately come to an end of myself, my strength, my abilities, my, my, my ability to solve or control or figure things out on my own. I wish we could just skip all of that and God could just bring us to salvation. But, but it seems like that might be the whole point. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough food for that day. In this way, I will test them. I will see whether they will follow my instructions. Get this, it's another test. I hate tests. Are you you listening to me? Are you paying attention? I'm going to give you bread from heaven, but will you trust me? Will you learn to trust me with your very life? When you're starving to death, when you have no ability to solve your own problems, will you trust me then? And then in verse 6 and 7, Moses then turns around, tells the Israelites this, but I want you to pay attention to his word choice here. It's peculiar. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it is the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. You will know that God, the Lord, saved you out of Egypt, that he is the God who saves. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord. Because he has heard your grumbling against him. Do you, do you get the phrasing there, the, the wording there? You will see the glory of the Lord. Now, this is the same phrase that is used in Exodus chapter 33 when Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock and God himself passed by and the glory of the Lord shone around. And th- this is the same language of Exodus 34 when Moses comes down the mountain with the, the Ten Commandments and his face is beaming, shooting with beams of light, and everyone's like, cover that up, I'm so afraid. 
This is the same language that Paul, the Apostle Paul, uses to describe our transformation into Christ-likeness. Listen to these words. But we all, with unveiled faces, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. That when you see the glory of the Lord, when you experience that, when you see that for yourself, you are transformed from the inside out. That's how the Apostle Paul describes us. So um, how will the people of God see the glory of the Lord and be transformed? And the answer seems to be bread. They're going to see the glory of the Lord in their daily bread. They will see his glory in the way he meets their most basic, most practical needs. They will see the glory of the Lord in their daily bread, and they will be transformed. They will taste and see the glory of God. Well, watch this, verse 13. In the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp, and when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw this, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it is. And Moses said to him, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Now in Hebrew, there's a little wordplay going on here because what is it and um, what it later is called manna, they sound the same. Like what is it is like men who? And they're like manna. Yeah. But I need to feel this tension here. Feel this um, because God just said, I'm going to show you my glory. And they see it. And what do they all say? What is it? I'm showing you my glory. What? what? So this, this should tell us something about how we see the glory of God. Theologians down through the ages, Martin Luther in particular, you should check this out. He talks about the, the hiddenness of God's glory. That his glory hides in the mundane. It is um, so that... Get this, he hides his glory so that only the humble can truly see him, so that only those who hunger and thirst for righteousness can taste him. Only those who are pure in heart can see God. That God hides his glory in plain sight, in the beggar you meet on the street, in a man writhing in pain on the cross, in a carpenter's son, in water, in a cup of wine, in a hunk of bread. So where do the people of God find the life-transforming glory of God? It, it's hidden in plain sight, and we get a description of it in verse 31. The people of Israel called the bread manna. What's it? It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Like, I always read this and think, this sounds like something that you'd serve like at a baby shower, or like a little cream cheese and like organic raspberries or something. It sounds, it's probably gluten-free. What exactly this bread is, this manna is, um, I don't know. And frankly, nobody really knows. It's miraculous. That's the point. But God is not super interested in telling them or us about the manna. Instead, he seems to be super interested in how you are to gather the manna. In fact, he's going to devote the next 20 verses to telling them and us with great specificity, this is how you are to gather the bread, how it's to be collected. So, um, so as not to kill you with Bible verses here, let me just summarize. Take as much as you want. Take as much as you want. You go out there, you just feast yourself. But, but um, no matter how much you take, to a little or a lot, it will be enough. It will, it will be food for you. It will carry you through. But here's the deal. Don't try and save it up because it won't last. If you collect twice the portions, it'll be rotten the next day. It's only good for that day, only good for that day, only good for that day, except, except on the last day of the week. On the last day of the week, I'm going to let you collect twice as much because then on the Sabbath, nothing's going to appear, and you're going to know this isn't accidental. This is from the Lord. And then here's what I want you to do. I want you to save some as a reminder. You're going to put it in the Ark of the Covenant right next to the Ten Commandments. I want you to save this as a permanent reminder. And by the way, this is all you're going to eat for the next 40 years. Yeah. So how will the people of God see the life-transforming glory of the Lord? The answer seems to be bread. Through, through their daily bread. Through every day bringing their hungers to God and trusting him with just that day, just that day, 
They will learn to trust God one day at a time. They will learn to listen to the voice of the one who spoke all things into being. They will learn to pay attention to their hungers and the way it points them, not just to bread, but to God. They will learn to stop trying to save themselves and secure their future because you can't, you can't, you can't. And said, so you just need to relax. You need to learn that your life is utterly dependent upon God. And that's good. That's actually good. You, you will begin to taste and see the glory of, your God, of God in your daily bread. And then you will experientially come to know what gives you life. And it, it's not just manna. It's, it's God. He's the one who gives you life. Now, this story, the story about experientially knowing God through our daily bread, this became really, really significant to the people of God down through the ages. So this shaped their knowledge of God. So um, what is our, what, what, if you were to have a box and put everything that fits in there about our relation, the most important things, what is our relationship with God based upon? Uh, I would put the Ten Commandments, which is the moral law of God, thou shalt not kill. I would put the staff of Aaron so that we know we were once slaves, but we've been set free. God has destroyed the forces of evil on our behalf and called us into sonship. And I would put a piece of manna, a piece of bread. Because that's where we see the, experientially the glory of God. It's not just the moral knowledge of God. It's not just the knowledge of what he's done historically in the past to save us. But it is experiencing God's provision every day, every day, every day. That's what our relationship with God, that's what fits into that box, the Ark of the Covenant. That if you want to know God, if you know historically that Jesus died for you and you, know, you follow all the morals, it's not enough. You got to eat the bread. You got to eat the bread every day, every day. You got to experientially trust God every day. That's that's equal to those. And this then shaped not only their knowledge of God, it, it shaped their worship. Leviticus chapter two. What does gratitude to God? What does that taste like? Uh, it tastes like bread. That's what it tastes like. It's part of your worship. One of the, the top five ways you worship God, bread. It shaped their prayers. Psalm 127, do not eat the bread of anxious toil. One of the prayers of God's people, don't eat the bread of anxious toil. The bread should be a taste of God's provision. And it shaped Jesus' life. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is in the wilderness, starving, just like the people of God down through the ages. Satan shows up and tempts him. Uh, you don't have to be hungry. You can feed yourself. You can, you can eat the bread of your control. You can, you can make bread for yourself. You don't need to trust God. And, and Jesus' answer is, I'd rather starve. That's not where my life comes from. This shaped Jesus' teaching, Sermon on the Mount. He teaches us, give us this day our daily bread. That is how we are to pray. The one story, the one story that you will find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's only one. You know what it is? Multiplication of loaves and fishes. Now, why is this story so central to the life and teaching of Jesus? Huh? This shaped the early church, the earliest Christians. They celebrate their utter dependence upon Jesus in wine and bread. That somehow, according to the word of God, the, the same word that created all things and called all things into being, according to the word of God, bread is not just bread. This means that. This is like that. This points to that. That if we listen, if, if we really, if we pay attention, if we taste and see for ourselves, we will find that in and under and beneath our daily bread, you can, you can taste the goodness of God. You can smell gratitude. You, you can experientially know God cares for me. He loves me. He saved me. And I, I can trust him with today and I can trust him with tomorrow. So maybe, maybe I'm making too much out of bread. Or maybe not. Moses seems to think he seems to agree with me. Three books later, 40 years later, 
He's at the, at the end of this 40-year period of they've gone all the way through the wilderness and he's preaching his final sermons. That's what they think the book of Deuteronomy is. And he says, hey, let's talk for a minute about how God provided the daily bread. Listen to how he preaches this in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness for those 40 years? You remember that? To humble and to test you in order to know what was in your hearts, whether or not you would keep his commands. Do you remember those tests? Oh, they were terrible. He humbled you causing you to hunger, and then feeding you, causing you to hunger, causing so that your hunger would point him, and then feeding you with manna, which is neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So why did he bring them to the brink of starvation and then go to such lengths to teach them how to collect this bread? So that they would learn that man does not live on bread alone. So that they they would stop spending their lives trying to secure their future. trying Trying to overcome all obstacles. Trying to control everything on their own. Because you can't. That they would stop trying to save themselves. That they would learn experientially to trust God day by day by day. So that they could finally will find true security. Find a peace that passes understanding. They can finally begin to see like the hidden glory of God and let it transform them from the inside out. They could finally find a real rest because they realize their future is not dependent on them but dependent on God alone. And that's a good thing. So have you experienced this? I got a taste of this in COVID. I am a person who likes to control things. I don't know, hard to believe. But if we're like flying the plane, I want to be in the driver's seat, like uh, uh, everywhere. It doesn't matter. If we're driving, I want to drive. If we're on a plane, I want to fly. If we're at a church, I want the mic. I know. And COVID, uh, I, d- I, d- I didn't know what was going to happen the next week. It was literally dependent on, on the weather patterns because we were meeting outside. Ah. For, for years, God led me through that wilderness. And I feel like I'm growing a little bit. But the last few weeks, I've really been humbled. Um, our church, we have three people in our church right now. who are at the end of life. They're uh, definitely in the, the valley of the shadow of death. And you want to talk about giving up control. And you, you literally can't do anything. Some can't even eat for themselves. And here's, here's the part that's so humbling. All three of them are doing it with such faith that I go there to minister to them and I leave thinking, wow, I've just sat with Jesus. When when you can literally give up everything in life, let go of everything, because you're holding on to the one thing that truly gives you life. And that's Jesus. And that cannot be taken away. It's humbling. And that, that test is coming for all of us. And I'm pretty sure the only way to become like that is one day at a time looking to God to provide your daily bread. We have to be a people who eat and drink the promises of God, who have tasted and seen. We don't just know about God. We know God. 